the book of Ephesians and chapter 2. The reason we're going to chapter 2 is uh, because we are, of course, concerned with biblical theology here, not systematic theology. Ephesians is a crucial book for the doctrine of the church and the right understanding of the church, and some of that will come out because that's what uh, I'm focused on here, but not on uh, all of the doctrine that is, um, uh, is important to Paul in this epistle. Um, we are up to uh, the place where we are now considering the church. Last week we looked through particularly Romans 11 and uh, we saw that uh, God has not forgotten about his people Israel. But between the comings, he's not dealing with Israel. He's dealing with the church. That's where our focus needs to be too. And uh, that's why the New Testament, particularly Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles, is focused on the church more than it is on Israel. It doesn't focus on the land promises or the kingdom or things like that of Israel because that's not where God is focused when we're talking about the church. The idea of kingdom does come up in the New Testament. If you read Colossians 1, you'll see that we've been translated from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love or his dear son. Do you remember that in Colossians 1, those of you that read it? So we're in a kingdom uh, and we have to be in a kingdom because uh, we're adopted into God's family and we are connected to God. We are also connected to Christ. So in the broad senses of the term, uh, we are in uh, God's kingdom, but we are not in the material kingdom on earth. And remember, this is where we have to get grounded again in the creation project. This is what the Bible's about. The Bible's about the creation project. So when we get rooted into that and the purposes for that, you can see that we are not yet in that kingdom. Do you see? So we are in a kingdom, and if you want to pray to God about expanding his kingdom, then that's fine, but just understand what you're meaning by that. You're not meaning what Jesus meant when uh, he told us to pray or told his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come. There, that's the material kingdom he's talking about, okay? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a material kingdom. That's when, if you like, heaven comes to earth. Um, so we, we should understand uh, that that is an important aspect, okay? We should uh, be discerning about that. So I told you to read Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And was there anything else that I told you? <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, so that's all right, not the remnant. Okay, well, let's uh, chug along and... and uh, pick some things up here. So chapter 2 of Ephesians and again I'm just picking up on a few things here okay and he says here in verse 10 we are his workmanship created notice in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in in them. Now when it says in Christ Jesus, it's talking about in the risen Christ. Look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We're talking about a crucified Christ here, not a Christ before the cross. Do you see? The church is not an entity that exists before the cross. Jesus said in uh, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. I will in the future. Not that he had or was building it. And uh, as we, we have taken pains to, to point out, 
the death of Christ is part of the gospel, so you can't preach the gospel unless Christ has died. But the resurrection of Christ is part of the gospel too, and you can't preach that unless he's been risen <laughs> and ascended. Uh, moreover, the power to walk the way that we ought to walk, to die to ourselves and to live through the power of the Holy Spirit to Christ, is the power that comes through the resurrection. <clears throat> Uh, the Holy Spirit is given to us after the resurrection. J Jesus had to go away so that the Holy Spirit had, could come, do you see? And um, there are numerous passages, I think many of them that we've looked at, which, which point that out. Why is it, therefore, that so many Christians, good, good men of God, have believed that the church is in the Old Testament. Folks, it's because they have a, a preconceived idea that they then cram into the story of the Bible and they don't ask important questions like what, you know, what connection does the church have to the resurrection? It has an absolutely fundamental connection to the resurrection. No resurrection, no church. And so there could not be a church before Christ had risen. That's very important. You find it all the way through. In fact, when you, when you really keep that in your mind and you read Paul's epistles, you'll see that come out all the time, especially for the doctrine of sanctification. So, let's, uh, it says we're workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That is the church, okay? And then we are told to remember something verse 11 therefore remember that you once gentiles in the flesh because he's writing to gentiles in ephesus who are called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision there would be jews made in the flesh by hands that at that time you were without christ being aliens from the commonwealth of israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. And then he says that you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, several things that we have to note here then. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we were without Christ. When were Gentiles without Christ? Well, before the gospel was spread by Paul and others to the Gentiles. You remember we looked at Acts 10 and... and uh, Peter had to realize that and so on. So uh, he's talking about that. He talks about being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. What is the commonwealth of Israel? Well, that would be the, uh, the hope, <coughs> excuse me, and um, the inheritance of the nation of Israel. Particularly in this context, it would be those things that Israel is promised that also we as Gentiles can enter into too. Strangers from the covenants of promise, not just the covenant. This is where covenant theologians often trip up because they have one covenant. Did you know that? They have one covenant that covers the church and that is called the covenant of grace. Okay, it doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. But they read it into places, okay? And then they call it covenant of grace. And then what they do is ignore what the Bible says about the covenants and they put their own interpretation into the covenant of grace. So they, it's make your, make your own covenant up to do what you want it to do, which is based on your idea of a one people of God and your idea of, you know, you, you, it's based on deduct in deduction. It's as a theological covenant. It's not found in the Bible anywhere. And if you look at, uh, at systematic theologies uh, by Reformed scholars, which is what I do all the time, uh, you will find that their exegetical um, backing and foundation for the covenant of grace is pathetic. It really is pathetic. I mean, they don't have any. It's deductive, like their theology is generally deductive. That's the way that they do their theology. So, 
Here it says covenants of promise. Well, what are the covenants of promise? They're certainly not that. Okay, the covenants of promise would be okay, the Abrahamic covenant, and particularly that thing which is uh, ascribed, you know, the spiritual blessings for, uh, for um, excuse me, the, the Gentiles and the nations, thank you. And, uh, you know, other covenants, the new covenant. And then, you know, he would also talk about other promises and covenants that, that, that applied only to Israel. Because they were made with Israel and they were the ones that Israel were uh, or understood, at least to, a, to some part. The Gentiles had no part in any of that. So entering into the covenants, it's not just one covenant, it is entering into at least two. And the second one is the, co- is the new covenant, which is connected to the blood of Christ, verse 13. Do you see that? Christ said this is the blood of the new covenant. So that's why Paul brings that in. Having no hope and without God in the world. Because if you're not connected to the covenants, you're not connected to any hope. And particularly if you're not connected to the new covenant, which is Jesus Christ, then there's no salvation, there's no hope. Do you see? So, he says here in verse 14, For he, Christ, himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. He's using, of course, the idea of the Gentiles on one side of, uh, of the wall of the temple and the Jews on the other in the temple. Has made one, because that's what the church is. Okay, there's neither Jew nor Gentile in the church. So the church ought to be a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, loving God together, worshipping God together. Uh, not one side saying, hey, come and uh, do our practices because we've got an inside line. That's not what it's about at all. It's realising that we're both committed to the same Saviour, to the same book, Uh, as one another and helping one another. Of course, the church is predominantly Gentile. And that is um, uh, deliberately so. God has deliberately made the church mainly Gentile. How do we know that? By statistics. (laughs) We're now (laughs) counting them. Uh, But Romans 11, how, how does Romans 11 tell you that? Exactly, exactly, yes. He's given them a spirit of stupor. He's given, you know, there, there's a remnant, but, uh, but for most of Israel, you know, they're still in, blo- in darkness, Romans 10. So, um, but the, the church is this new thing. And uh, we'll see this in a second. Having abolished... In his flesh, the enmity, that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Do you see? The cross is absolutely essential to the church. And um, what he says here is very crucial for our um, understanding of the biblical story because Paul calls the church a new man. It's new. That means it didn't exist before it was st- formed. Uh, it doesn't, didn't exist in the... Old Testament. It's new. So uh, what you find in the Old Testament is that you find uh, emphasis on the Israel. Not completely, but mostly. What you find in the New Testament is emphasis on the church. Do you see? Thus making peace, that he might reconcile them to one body. That one body is his body because the church is in Christ, in the risen Christ. 
And then he says in verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens and, uh, sorry, with the saints. Now the saints here would be saved Jewish people. And members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Well, again, do you see no apostles and prophets New Testament prophets, that's what they are. No apostles and prophets, no death of Christ, no foundation. So again, those people that teach that the church is in the Old Testament are just plain wrong, folks. I mean, it's just obvious when you put these things together. The church is not in the Old Testament. All right? It's very, very clear. Now, this, this is helpful because it means that we have some distinctions. You know, in the Old Testament, or even for a lot of the Old Testament, we have focus on Israel, don't we? Okay, so it, it's really centered around Israel. The nations are promised other things uh, in connection with Israel and so on, but it's mainly Israel. And then in the New Testament, well, Christ dies, of course, and then in the New Testament, predominantly, Okay? In the Gospels, it's still mainly Israel. Still, it's, we're still kind of really Old Testament-y, you know, as far as Israel's the, the center, but Gentiles are also promised salvation. But once we move into Acts and once we move into uh, Paul's epistles and so on, then the focus is on the church. And we have these two distinct concentrations or perspectives if we say the church is in the Old Testament, what are we going to do with Israel? You know, we, we will either say that the church and Israel existed in the Old Testament, and I don't think anybody says that. Or we're going to have to take passages in the Old Testament that are written clearly to Israel, and describe Jerusalem and Zion and things like that, and we're going to have to apply them to the church, which means that we're going to have to take them away from Israel. Do you see that? As a nation. Well, how does that relate to the Mormons who have all these theories about the 12 tribes and, you know... Well, really, I don't have time to go into that, but nothing of this relates to the Mormons. The Mormons is a, is a completely ridiculous, you know, fiction. It really is. I mean, it's, it's this at least, you know, these people, that the, uh, the people that believe it, that the Israel or the church is represented by Israel in the Old Testament and that there's continuity between believing Israel in the, in the Old Testament and the church today. It's kind of one big glob. Um, you know, those people, they've got reasons and biblical theological reasons for saying so. There is absolutely nothing that Mormons can, you know, put their hands on or to, or at all or point to. I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's why they had to write their own books. Yeah. So, um, so what you will find though, okay, what you're going to find is that people that, that uh, say this is that they will say there is a line of continuity, okay, so we have church all the way through. Or because this obviously, if you bring up the cross, you bring up the resurrection, you bring up stuff like that, then they think, ah, hold on, we've got to make a difference here. Okay, They're, they've read the Old Testament. They know the Old Testament. They know the promises made to Israel. They've read them. They don't always believe them, but they've read them. And um, they know that if we say church, we've got a bit of a problem because the church is so clearly delineated from Acts 2 onwards and not before that it just seems to be a very clear distinction that's been, that the Bible itself makes. So what do we do? We've got a theology where there's one people of God within the covenant of grace. Do you see? The covenant of grace is a big umbrella for all the saved people from Adam, if he was saved, 
all the way down to the last person before the new heavens and new earth. Do you see? It's a, that, everyone's got to be squished under that umbrella. And as one people of God, and they were all the same. So what they do is that they often prev prevaricate. Okay? They don't like... I mean, you have to name what's going on, whether they like it or not. But they will say, they will use this euphemism. Okay? It's kind of general, isn't it? Okay, but is it the same as the church? I've, I've had this in a debate I had with uh, uh, one of these guys. And it's on my blog. Uh, it was a couple of years ago now. And I tried to get him. I said, you said as one people, people of God, but you say that saints in the Old Testament were part, weren't part of the church. So that means that the church is one people of God and saints in the Old Testament must be another people of God. Otherwise, you have to say, like your covenant theology friends, that the church is in the Old Testament and the church is the one people of God. But you can't just call save people in the Old Testament people of God and save people in the New Testament the church. Why don't you just call them both the same thing if they are both the same? And, you know, I couldn't, couldn't get through that because he saw the tension, he saw the problem, but he, he could not furnish a, a clear explanation of why there was a disparity. And I think it, the reason was, not be, certainly not because this guy lacked intelligence, he was a very smart guy, but just because the way that he had deduced his doctrine and the way that he followed the systematic theologians and the dogmaticians is that he had not even, that, that question hadn't even come up. Do you see? Um, not at all... Uh, um, not a reflection on him and, and, and uh, those people that hold this position. But remember my teaching about um, our default position. Our default position is to think independently of God. Did you? So Christians and non-Christians can do that. And it always ends up in, uh, remember the, I'm going back a bit now, but uh, remember the rules of affinity with the, I said that when you do that, you end up with, with uh, C4s and C5s. In other words, you, you end up with a lot of deduction and very little scripture and you go around with your deductions and with your conclusions and you go around looking for proof texts. Yeah. Do you remember that? Work, yeah. okay, a whole bunch of, of ref, um, inferences and, and conclusions but no scripture to back it up. Okay? That a lot of, I'm afraid to say, not all of it. But a lot of Reformed theology, particularly in eschatology, is like that. Okay? And in that, it actually resembles all other autonomous human thought. Do you see? It's the same thing. So, so you can talk to a Jehovah's Witness, not save people, and you can point to the Bible verses and say, what does it say? Yeah, but what does it say? And they'll, they'll go hop, skip and jump mm -hmm. through the Bible to get away from that passage, won't they? And a Mormon will do the same. Have you ever wondered why an our millennialist will do the same? Someone who believes that the church is Israel or the new Israel, they'll do the same thing. You point them, yeah, but what does it say here? Okay, boom, they'll be over here. Well, what about this in the New Testament? Do you say, oh, what about this? They do the same thing. That's because their theology is deductive. And that's how they've arrived at their conclusions. They've not arrived at their conclusions uh, inductively. So they're not thinking inductively, do you see? They're always reading their conclusions into the text. If I, if, if I said this and you lot were a bunch of replacement theologians, you know, you would be throwing things at me and burning me in effigy if not in reality um, depending on the century but um, but I, I stand by it I've, I've uh, I have around about 60 
systematic theologies in my library. Okay, I've read and read and read these guys for years and years and years, and I appreciate a lot of what they say, but why do they, how can they miss this stuff? Do you see? How can they miss that the church is a new man? Not an old man. It's because of their deduction. So, um, we have to, this, if, for anyone who says the church is in the Old Testament, take them to Ephesians 2.20. Okay. The foundation is Christ and the apostles. And it says, in whom the whole building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Ah, they say, ah, yes, see, the church is a temple. And Paul says that we're temples. And in 1 Corinthians 6, for example. And that's true. That's true. But from that, you cannot again infer that because Paul calls us temples and the church itself a temple, that the temple, um, the Levitical temple, Israel's temple, the literal one, <laughs> okay, is thereby done away with. That doesn't follow. After all, uh, Jesus said, destroy this temple, in three days I'll raise it up. So his body's a temple. That was a literal body. He's talking literally there. He's not saying spirit, this spiritual temple that the church is all in mystically. Okay? No, he's talking about his physical flesh is a temple. Do you see? So he's, you use the term, or, or the Bible uses the term temple in different ways. All in the sense of God's holy possession you know, unless it's an ungodly, a pagan temple. But not necessarily the same thing. The church is not the literal physical body of Jesus. The church is not uh, you, your body, being a temple, which is your physical body, by the way. He means your physical body is a temple. Okay? Well, that's not the same as the church, because that's a non-physical temple. Do you see? which he's talking about here. So none of this discussion about temples, which you find in the New Testament a lot, none of it replaces uh, the Old Testament idea of a temple. So when we get to 1 Peter, um, is it 1 Peter? And it talks about uh, we're, we're built as a, a holy temple to the Lord and so on. Uh, He's just using a, 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 a metaphor, a figure of speech. You see, he's, he's not saying that we've replaced the, uh, the temple that you find in the Old Testament, the Davidic temple or, you know, the uh, promised temple. Why is that important to get that understanding? Well, because of the priestly covenant, folks. The priestly co covenant promises a literal temple. Do you see? Jesus foretells of a literal temple that will be despoiled by the Antichrist. So it's really important to get this, this understanding and don't come to the text with a pre-understanding. Or if you, if you do, try to, try to think through your pre-understanding, which means pay attention to what it's saying and match it up with what you came with and see if the two things go together, and usually, you know, often they don't, actually. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Well, that means the Spirit has to be present in a way in the uh, New Testament church that he wasn't in the Old Testament. Okay? And again, this is not systematic theology, but we can at least say this that in the Old Testament you find a Spirit of God coming upon individuals don't you? Samson, Bezalel, um, people like that, even Saul. All right? David. Um, but only for a time and usually for a function. Never for salvation. That's always something in the future. Okay? That's always something in the future. And when you look at the promise of the Spirit coming to wash 
Israel clean and, and to spread the knowledge of God throughout the world, that's always in the context of what we now know is the second coming. Do you see? And again, if you get this, these things right, you can figure out where everything goes and your picture doesn't change. Um, but the church needs the Spirit. You are, in, you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You're placed through baptism, spiritual baptism, into uh, the Holy Spirit, into the body of Christ. And um, you're one in the Spirit. So, he continues with his doctrine here, chapter 3. Are we okay there? Are there any questions? I have to go fairly quickly through this. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Okay, well, um, this is where I start to show my heretical colors. Okay. Um, look, at, look at the text. Please look at the text. Okay, verse 2. What is the dispensation of the grace of God? After you've read the passage. Okay, that's not bad. God going to the Gentiles. That's one idea. Let's let's read a bit further on. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, and I'll come back to that, as I have briefly written already, he'd already told him this, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of, God, of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Okay, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. All right? So verse 6 is the key. And I think, like you say, God going to the Gentiles, I mean, I paraphrase that, but, but I think that's basically, we're on the right track here. Okay? This new thing, the church, I mean, this includes Israel, but it's, Paul's here, talking to Gentiles, isn't he? So he's focusing on them. So it's basically God going to the Gentiles. That's the dispensation of the grace of God. The church, if you like, that he's been talking about, that's the dispensation of the grace of God. This word dispensation here is uh, okonomia, okay, in the Greek, where we get our word economy from, okay? And uh, it can mean administration, it can mean stewardship, okay? But you've got to be careful that you, um, that you don't pick the wrong word, okay? It can mean those things. But if you say it just means stewardship, like a, a lot of people do, then you've got stewardship on the brain. Do you see? You pick that word stewardship and then you're... you're thinking is dominated by the word stewardship and then you start to derive a doctrine of this which is based on stewardship well God has given us a stewardship do you see well it God had given this revelation to Paul that's true but was it a was it a stewardship that's been given, not just to Paul, but a stewardship by which the whole of the um, workings of God between the Testament, oh, sorry, between the first and second advent 
can be called. That's a, that's a, can you see, that's a big leap. It's a big leap to say Paul has been given this understanding and he has a stewardship as the apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah? That's one thing and that's what the text says, okay? But to say that the whole period of the church is the dispensation, the stewardship of the church, that's pushing it, at least from this verse. Do you see? Um, so uh, it's not to say that there isn't a, a, uh, an economy or you can even say era, an epoch or something like that. Um, I, I'm okay with that. In fact, you'll find that covenant theologians even use the word dispensation like that. Okay. Um, Louis Burkhoff and Charles Hodge both have four dispensations in their systematic theologies. Um, Gerhardus Voss speaks about dispensations and so on. These are, these are reformed theologians. But, but um, if we're going to make something, um, a, a system from this kind of usage, I think that we are pushing the boat out a little too far. Do you see? Furthermore, and of course, oh, what am I referring to here? I'm referring to this system of theology. Well, it's not really a system of theology, and I'll get to that. Okay? Now, I am a dispensationalist, okay? As far as all of what counts to be a dispensationalist, apart from I couldn't care less about dispensations, which is why I've not talked about them. Do you realize we've got up to Ephesians and, and uh, how many lessons, how many hours have I taught from Genesis? And I've not mentioned dispensations. And have you missed them? I did, I, I, did, I did do one little session, I think, when I, we were talking about uh, the Abrahamic covenant. I did say that if we say that the Abrahamic covenant uh, brings in the dispensation of promise, what have we done? We've taken the focus off the Abrahamic covenant and we've placed it on a dispensation, which the text doesn't say. Do you see? Do you see that? So it's subtle, okay? It's subtle, but I think that dispensationalism, much of dispensationalism has been guilty of actually doing the same thing as Reformed theology. They've just done it in a different way. They have inferred these things and made a system out of it. Or a kind of system. It's really just an eschatology and ecclesiology that they've made out of it. Do you see? And the thing is, I've, I've brought you through the Bible focused on what? Covenants and what God says. I can, I can say that there is an, an epoch or a dispensation, you know, it, we can call it that, of the Old Testament or under the law. We can talk about that, the mosaic, you know, from Moses all the way through to the end of the Old Testament. I mean, we're talking about Israel under the law. Do you see? Um, but can you say that, that Abraham had a dispensation given to him? Or Noah had a dispensation given, a stewardship given to him? Not really. Not really. He had a covenant given to him. But he was asleep when it was given to him. Do you see? So, um, this is why I think that, that this, this is not helpful. I mean, we're stuck with it, okay? We're stuck with it, but it's not helpful um, because it puts the focus on these economies, these dispensations, and the Bible doesn't put the emphasis there. 
The Bible puts the emphasis on the covenants. Yes? How is he using that word dispensation? What is, what is yeah, we've got to get back to that, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Given it's what it's not, but what is it? Yes, I think what it is is, uh, is something, and I'm, I, I haven't spoken about mystery yet, but it's this idea of the new man in chapter 2. It's this idea of the church and what the church actually is what God has done. It's new. It's Jew and Gentile together. I mean, it's mainly Gentiles, but it's new, and it's, it's a post-resurrection, spirit-generated um, uh, body of, of believers, disconnected from Israel and its promises. Do you see? And to be completed at or before the second coming of Christ. What, you know, because Paul in, in Romans 11 has said that the fullness of the Gentiles has got to come in and then he will turn, God will again turn to Israel and its covenant promises. Do you see? The dispensation of time of the church. Well, see, there's your problem, you see. Yeah, I know. If we call it a time period, we can only call it a time period um, I mean, we can designate it that if you want, okay, a period of time. I'm not saying that you are recommending that, way, but, but you can designate it that way, but what's, what's the use of it? I mean, it's the church, isn't it, which is different to Israel. So what's the period of time got anything to do with it, unless you, you are chronicling when God did things? So this is what has... Uh, uh, and I can't, I wish I could stop and, and, and um, go through this. If you want to, those of you that want to go to my blog and read boring articles about this, okay, I've got some, some boring articles about, um, oh, what did I call them? Well, one of them is called Renewing Dispensationalism or Renewing, I can't remember. I think it's Renewing Dispensational Theology, okay? And uh, another one, I think there's two articles in that one. And then uh, another one is, oh yeah, Reluctant Dispensationalist. Okay. Read, um, if you want to read those, you'll find out okay, why, I'm, why I say this, why I take this position. There's nothing, I do not deny anything the dispensationalists teach. So I call myself a dispensationalist in that sense. You've heard me teach a clear distinction between Israel and the church and the covenantal promises to Israel are coming through. You've, uh, you've heard me teach on a Davidic kingdom. You've heard me teach um, on uh, the fact that, that these covenants that God gave were given to different people at different times and they run things through. What I, you haven't heard me teach is dispensations. Why? Because they're not important. Because God doesn't talk about them. Because the Bible doesn't mention them. And so uh, here we are, we've run into it now. But then if we've run into it, what have we run into? We've run into a part of his doctrine of the church. Do you see? It's a part of his doctrine of the church. Here's another thing, and um, this, might, this is for those of you that want to muse on this for a while. <clears throat> Yeah. I'm going to ask the really obvious question. Tell me what your understanding is and definition of dispensationalism. I mean, I, I get a gentle <laughs> sense. You know, you're dispensing like something from God to to the world or to a particular. Set okay. Of believers, but I'd really like to hear you sort of clearly define it because I'm I'm sort of 
Okay, well, Un undefined in my understanding. we would all probably call ourselves dispensationalists, and that's fine. But um, I have another set of articles <laughs> <laughs> about the definition of dispensationalism. I think this, I, I, I talk somewhat about that here. But if you go to the standard dispensational authors and you go for a definition of dispensationalism, you don't get one. They won't give you one. They will give you a definition of a dispensation. But the definition of a dispensational is not the definition of the system. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Yeah, sure. And that's what you've just asked for. And that's, the, that's one of the problems with dispensationalism is that it's very ill-defined. And then they, have to, they talk about the sine qua non of the dispensationalist approach, which is, is from Charles Ryrie. Okay, which is that uh, literal hermeneutic and distinction between Israel and the church and focus on the glory of God. Well, that third one, I'm sorry, you've got to kick that one to the touch because Reformed theology focuses much more on the glory of God than dispensationalism does. So Ryrie was the one that came up with no. the system no. of dispensationalism? No, no, he's the one who came up with what's called the sine qua non, the essential elements, which um, I think are wrong. I mean, the first two are right. The first two are right, but the, the third one is not a distinguishing feature of dispensationalism. And the way you know that is by reading dispensationalists and how they don't talk about it. And read Reformed theologians and see that they do talk, talk about it, particularly Jonathan Edwards, somebody like that, talks about it all the time. So, you know, it can't be a distinguishing feature of dispensationalism if uh, a non-dispensationalist is... is saying more about it than dispensationalists say about it. Why, why come up with a system when, you're, when it can't be defined? Well, be, what, yeah, see, I mean, when it's just all well they haven't, you see, what they've done is that they've, they've got some important things right. You know, what, the plain sense we might say literal hermeneutic, you know, which we've been basically following, okay? I mean, that's right. They've got that right. Um, you've, uh, th this, this, understanding that, that the church is, is not in the Old Testament and Israel is separate to the church and the promises to Israel in the Old Testament are different than the promises to the church in the New Testament and you've got to keep those things distinct. Absolutely right. But then they name themselves not after the covenants, the biblical covenants, but they name themselves after these economies which are, I mean, where have you read about those? They're not there, they're tertiary. They're not even secondary. They're tertiary, they're just thinking, oh yeah, and. You know, this was between, this was in the Old Testament, this was in the New Testament, or this was under Moses, or well, so what? It's not important. You go any deeper than that, by the way, and you end up with nonsense, which is what I was uh, trying to bring out, that, that when you talk about the, um, the dispensation of promise, what's that? Oh, well, that's Abraham. Yeah, but Abraham didn't have a dispensation given to him. He had a covenant given, him, given to him. And covenants include promises, but covenants are not the same as promises. Do you see? And what's a covenant of promise? I mean, oh, there's loads of promises in the Old Testament. All the covenants have promises in them. So what? So why is that a covenant of promise and other ones are not covenant of promises? You see, it just it's, it gets dumb. And then you have a dispensation of conscience. What do you mean that, so, so under the law you didn't have conscience? It wasn't an important thing? It wasn't a major thing? Of course, I mean, it's, it's, see, you see, it's just so higgledy-piggledy, it's so uh, messed up. A dispensation of law, well, look, we got a lawyer over here. He knows that, that law is not the same as conscience. It's not even in the same category of things. Okay? And conscience is not the same thing as, as grace. Do you see? Or promise. These are different, these are, they're in different semantic domains. Do you see? They don't belong in the same domain. It's like egg and jellyfish. 
you know, they don't belong in the same, I mean, they're both things, sure. But you say dispensation of egg, the dispensation of jellyfish, you're not talking about the same thing when you're using the word dispensation, do you see? Because the, the object changes what dispensation can mean. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so I've, I've had these debates with, with dispensationalists, okay, some of them really view me of, as being, you know, well, look at me through slanty eyes. And, um, and I say, look, you, you've got to define your system. What do you, what do you mean? Because the Bible does not support what you're saying. I see a covenant with Abraham. I see a covenant with Noah. I see a covenant with David. I don't see any dispensations there at all. At least God doesn't think they're important enough to talk about in the Old Testament. So what are you talking about them for? But a real important thing here, you can have your question in a minute, Gary, but look, a really important thing, because I didn't get round to it because Rick in, uh, interrupted me, uh, which was, which was, had to do with those of you that, that want to ponder this, okay? Dispensations, the way that they're defined, which is an economy that God gives to, or stewardship that God gives in certain times or ages, yes? Dispensations, dispensations, are descriptive. Whereas covenants are prescriptive. There's a big difference between the doctor saying you need this medicine and giving you a prescription to get it. This is, this is the medicine and let me describe it to you. Well, that's not going to do you any good unless he gives you a prescription to actually get it. Do you see? A prescription gives you something to do with it. A description just gives you information. Dispensationalism, if they focus on dispensations, all they've got is descriptions. You can't do anything with them. Do you see? If you focus on the covenants, the focus, the covenants are telling you what God's going to do. They're prescriptive. Being prescriptive, you can build a theology around them and with them. So you, with the covenants, because you can build a hermeneutic around them, because you can build a worldview around them, because you can, um, you can take the story of the Bible and you can build an eschatology, you can build a theology, you can build apologetics out of them. Because, you, you know, no apologist uh, goes to the Bible with an unbeliever and says, oh, you see uh, here it's talking about Zion and Israel, that's the church. Do you see? And, uh, you know, you see this in, in Genesis, this is talking about, or, or these, this description of, of uh, the streams in the desert or the wolf lying down with the lamb, that's talking about figuratively how a Christian feels when they're born again. <laughs> Nobody does that, because the unbeliever's going to say, you know what, you're full of it, you don't even believe what that bo book says. No, what Christians do is that they go to the creation account and they take it literally. They go to the resurrection of Christ and they take it literally. They go to the fact there's only one God and they take it literally. All of the major doctrines of the Christian faith they take literally. It's when you get into the, you know, things that make us squabble. That, when like infant baptism, Okay? That's an inference. That's not there anywhere in the Bible. That's an inference. Okay? You can't find it in the Bible. Do you see? Mm -hmm. uh, and, but you don't, see, apologists don't go there because unbelievers will call them on it. 
do you see? Or cultists will call them on it. How, you can't say to uh, a, Jehovah's Witnesses, a Jehovah's Witness who thinks 144,000 in Revelation 7 and 14 are a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses that no they're not, okay, they're actually the universal church of numberless individuals from all nations. Well, you're both on the same airy-fairy ground, aren't you? You're both, okay, nowhere near what the Bible is saying. You've taken leave of the text of Scripture and you're making it say, in fact, the, actually the Jehovah's Witnesses are, are closer because at least they take the 144,000 literally. Do you see? So, sorry, what was your question? Go back to you know, the dispensation of grace. Is it, a, is it a description or is it a prescription? And why, is it, why do they put that word in there? Well, I'm, so I've not even got there yet. No, okay. That's a great question. That's a great question. Okay? Great. What is grace? A dis grace is something that's dispensed. Well, you know, grace and truth is, uh, comes through Jesus Christ, the law through Moses. It doesn't mean there's no grace in the Old Testament. You see, nothing but grace in the Old Testament. Okay? But what, what he's saying here is this saving grace of, of God that makes us free of the law. Do you see? Because it's faith in Christ and his merits, not faith in us and our merits. Mediated through a, a, a legal system. Do you see? So, um, if we say dispensation of grace, again, is grace the same thing as law? It's not in the same category, is it? You can, be, you can have law and have grace, can't you? They don't contra no, contradict each other because they're not the same thing. Uh, not, they're not even competitive, really. So um, you can say dispensation of the church. That would be closer because the church is an actual entity that exists between one historical point and another historical point. But if you're saying dispensation of the church, what are you saying? A time period where the church exists. So what? It's descriptive of a time period. If you want to explore it, you're going to have to go past dispensation. You're going to actually get into the Bible, what the Bible says the church is. Do you see? So, so people have hogtied themselves to this, and you will find, and I have found this experimentally, it's been painful for me, uh, for many years that dispensationalists will routinely focus more on dispensations than they will on covenants. And that's the downfall of their, of their theology. And that's why, I really believe, that is why uh, many Reformed theologians and so on, they just they despise dispensationalism because they say, look, it's not even, you can't even do anything with it. It's not, you know... No wonder you write these books with fiery dragons and solar eclipses on the covers, okay? No wonder you, you have these nutters who make a living, okay? Taking a, um, looking at this stuff and just picking a bit and, and just feeding people's fascinations. Because you don't have a coherent system that you all know where you're going and, and like Reformed theology does. Another thing, notice I said this at the beginning. I said that dispensationalism is eschatological. They put a lot of emphasis on eschatology. And I said that Reformed theology, covenant theology, is teleological. In other words, it talks about purpose, aim. Well, folks, theologically speaking, covenant theology has got it wrapped up because they've got the purpose, <laughs> they've got the aim, do you see? Because they've got a purpose and aim, they have a system that they can build up. They can answer uh, areas philosophically, they can answer areas over here from their system of theology because they've got a goal. 
Do you see? Dispensationalists have just got end times. It's descriptive. Do you see that? You can't, can't build a, a system of theology from it, or a system of apologetics, or a biblical counseling system from that if you focus on dispensations. But if you focus on the covenants, then you can. Okay, because you can talk about what covenants relate back to the God who gave them. Do you see? And to Christ at the center of it all. The dispensations, Christ is introduced as, a, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a bit part player. He doesn't stroll onto the scene until the Bible mentions him and then he strolls off again. And so it's, a, it's difficult to have a Christ-centered theology when we're talking about dispensations that he may be involved with and may not be involved with. But if you talk about the covenants, and I've said the covenants are all wrapped up in the one covenant, that new covenant, which is Christ. And I say that the earth is made by him and for him. Do you see? And this goes into why the covenants are so important and what God's doing through these. Then I hope you can see, then Christ is front and center. And you have a teleology as well. So that's why, I mean, all of the good names are gone. So I have to call my uh, take on things biblical covenantalism, which is easier to say than to write. And it's not easy, and it's not easy to say. But I, I can't call it covenant theology because the uh, reform guys have got that. Uh, so I call it biblical covenantalism because I'm talking about the biblical covenants. Do you see? That way I get everything that dispensationalism, all the good stuff, and I don't have the baggage. Moreover, I can make, and we don't have time for this, I can make a systematic theology from this, whereas dispensationalists do not make systematic theologies from their uh, view. They don't, some of them even say that, that dispensationalism is not a system of theology. Now, I have to say, many of them, the older ones, Robert Leitner and people like that, will say it's a system of theology. But then they go and say it's restricted, actually, to two things, ecclesiology and eschatology. Well, that's not a system, folks. Only if it includes theology proper, the doctrine of creation, you know, the church and so on. Is it a full theology, a systematic theology? So it limits itself because it focuses on dispensations. All right, let's get back to this text here. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> um, the dis if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you. Which verse now? Verse 2, chapter 3. Okay. So here it's going to be a stewardship that is given to Paul for the Gentiles. Do you see? Well, of course it's been given to him. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, so that's his job. Do you see? It's, he's talking about his job. This is his job role or his job description. How? That by revelation he made known to me the mystery. So here's the next word. Okay, and I'm not going to spend so long on this one. <clears throat> but we can get through this pretty quickly now. Okay, mystery. It's from the Greek term mysterion. Well, it has to do with what is hidden. Okay, now we have to look at the, uh, the way that it's used. Okay. Now, obviously, he's, he's, uh, he's limited the church to the New Testament, do you see, by it's linking it to the death and resurrection of Christ. He's called it a new man. So, he said that this, this has, become, has been a revelation given to him, and it's part of what he's passing on, which means they didn't have access to it before. So the idea of the mystery is something that's been hidden that is now revealed. Do you see that? Uh, 
uh, which in other ages, verse 5, was not made known to the sons of men. Okay? So in, the, in other ages, now that age is there, that's not the same as dispensation, because dispensation has been defined as stewardship there. Um, but you can, so I can say epoch, and that's, that's fine, and our age, and that, that works fine. You, can, you know what we're talking about. Before the death and resurrection of Christ, you know, before this, I was preaching this stuff and so on, it wasn't revealed. But then you've got this qualifier, as. As it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles, apostles and prophets. Well, notice the holy apostles and prophets are the ones that are the foundations in verse 20 with Christ, you see? So again, that underlines the fact that you had to have the apostles and you had to have New Testament prophets because that's who they are. Um, you had to have them preaching this stuff because it's revealed by the spirits and it has to do with Christ and uh, as in Christ. So, um, does this mean therefore, this is where a debate comes between um, what we might call the dispensationalists and the progressive dispensationalists. Uh, John Wright, who was here, you know, he was more progressive dispensationalist, although he was a good solid, he understood this stuff well. I was impressed with him on this, in, in this area. Um, but he was more progressive. And um, the, the progressives say that the word mystery here was something that was not revealed until now but may have been known before. Because it's not revealed as it was revealed, you see, now. So that's where they get that from. All right? And you can see that there's some purchase there to do that. Even though theologically, in the context, I think that's, that you struggle somewhat. And also in the Greek, um, you know, with the Greek construction, you struggle as well. But the problem is, and I told you to read Colossians 1, okay? So if we go to Colossians 1, which is written about the same time by the same guy, look how he defines it there. This is, by the way, this is how Scripture is supposed to interpret Scripture, not the way it's often done, where um, you just join verses together, ignoring the context, and says, I can come up with a doctrine that you like, and call it, and, you, and your, your pretext for that is Scripture interpreting Scripture. No, it's you misusing the Bible. Yeah. So, um, but here, I, I hope that you can see how Paul... Uh, himself uses it. Uh, he says, let me see, uh, Colossians and chapter 1, and let me get the thing here, which is verse 27. But we'll go from verse 24. And now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking of the, in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So he's talking about, again, the church. The uh, his perspective is slightly different, but he's talking about the same thing. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship, there's dispensation from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory, or glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of God glory okay so in Ephesians it's you in Christ in the church here it's Christ in you which is just the, the other side of the coin but notice here the mystery is hidden it's not known verse 26 so that shows us that when in Ephesians he's saying uh, as he's not using the term uh, comparatively but he's using it contrastively do you see so it wasn't known a little bit no yeah. which is why you don't read anything of it in the old testament which again is a kind of hint that it's not there mm -hmm. 
they didn't know about it. Why would they? If you think about the fact that, that the church, uh, God's dealing with Israel, so he doesn't mention the church, which isn't, he's not dealing with, then why would he mention it to them? And do you think, you, you see why he doesn't mention the land promises and the, the promises for Jerusalem and so on in the New Testament? Because he's dealing with the church. Well, what's that got to do with the church? Do you see? So, um, let's move up. Um, we've got to move on, get cracking here. And we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 and 2 Thessalonians, you've noticed the second coming of Christ features in every chapter. Okay, so it's definitely an eschatological uh, pair of books. Okay. And we're not going to go all the way through them. I just want to pick out a few things that we've already seen um, that are in the book. So I want you to go, please, to uh, 1 Thessalonians and... Chapter 4, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, at the beginning he's talking about sanctification, and he talks about, um, his focus from verse 13 to the end of the chapter is on comfort, okay? That's, what he's, what, that's why he's speaking about what he speaks about. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, they're dead lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. There should be a difference between Christian sorrow and non-Christian sorrow. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who, are, who sleep in Jesus. See, there it is. I mean, it's absolutely certain. Okay? They're connected to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, they have more life than we do. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. So there's your cutoff point, until the coming of the Lord. but will by no means proceed. If you go to King James, it says prevent, which means pre-event in that context. Those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So now he calls the people that are asleep dead. Do you see in verse 16? Because he's talking about their bodies rise first. He says they're asleep because he's talking about their bodies. He's not talking about soul sleep here, okay? Right. They're with Christ. Um, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, that's bodily in the flesh, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Or so that word caught up is harpazo. Okay, it's, it's often descriptive of a thief who comes in and snatches something. Okay, so it often has a negative context, but obviously because it's talking about us going to be with the Lord, it's positive. But it, it's about a, a snatching away. Okay, the Greek, the Latin term is rapturo, so that's where you get the idea of rapture from. So uh, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up or raptured up together with them, with them, we can ask why in a second, in the clouds, not on earth, because we're going up, so it's in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. Where is he? He's in the air, he's not come to earth. And thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. And they are great words of comfort, they really are. Um, Now it doesn't tell us all we want to know. It doesn't tell us when, for example. (laughs) Unless you say, well, this is the coming of the Lord, you see? So if it's the coming of the Lord, this is the second coming. 
yeah, fine, but there's a problem with that, okay? The problem with it is that it, Christ doesn't come to the earth. He's not, you know, he's not described as coming to the earth as a man of war, coming to squash everybody, okay? We're going to him, do you see? Now, sure, a person can say, yeah, we go to him and then we come back with Christ. So it's kind of a yo-yo <laughs> rapture. It's not an idiot. But if it's a yo-yo rapture, it's kind of, well, why, why don't we just stick around until he <laughs> continue, you know, completes the journey? It, it's, you see, it's not, I mean, I know that that's not a decisive argument, okay? But, but it, it kind of, there's a, there's a little bit, there's enough um, absurdity in it, this idea of going up only to come back again, that you would have thought Paul would have said a little bit more about it. Um, the other thing is here is that w enough has been said, enough will be said here about the tribulation. Think about what we've looked at in the Old Testament in Daniel um, chapter 7, in um, the end of Daniel 9, in Daniel 12, and uh, um, Jeremiah 30. A um, whole bunch of places. Uh, about the, the Jews, this is a time when the Jews are going to be uh, pursued. And that matches up with Jesus' words in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. Okay? Which again is focused on the Jews, not focused on the church, because Christ hasn't risen yet. And it's talking about the end. Mm -hmm. The context is the second coming of Christ happening after these events. Do you see? So the question then comes up theologically, and the Bible doesn't answer it with a straightforward answer. What do we do with the rapture of the church? Paul has said in Romans 11, as I've uh, reminded you, that, that after the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, then God turns once again to Israel. When does he do that? Well, it looks as though from the pattern that we've been looking at, you know, and, and uh, we've only looked at uh, the tribulation passages so far in Matthew, a little bit, and in Luke a little bit there, you know, the days of vengeance and so on. Uh, it looks as though that, that if God's going to turn to Israel, Romans 11, he's going to have to be done with the church. If he's done with the church, what has happened? Do, do, do we just you know, stand around as spectators, seeing what goes on? Or are we taken up? Do you see? Is this snatching away, because you see the idea of the thief? Is this snatching away really a, a, uh, something that happens unexpectedly for the world? Do you see? Unexpectedly, not necessarily secretly. This idea of a secret rapture, I hate it. Yeah. Stomp it out. But it's not necessarily secret, but is it unexpected? Do you say, is it surprising? That's the thing. Um, so we have to kind of put this thing together, and I don't have time to do that here. So I've got some more articles. All right. <laughs> Trying, there's 12 of them, I think, trying to get the rapture right. I think that's what it's called. And that goes through the different rapture positions and, and tries to weigh the pros and cons. Okay? So that you can look on my blog, the Dr. Reluctant blog, and... and uh, find that, okay? Or find those. He's also on your Talos website. I think so. Yes, I think so. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes, although the Talos website, I've, I'm having to work on. I've kind of stopped putting things on there. Oh. Yeah, because, well, because the website is not allowing me to put anything on there right now. I've got to spend money. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, if you find them on the blog, then you can, or you can Google me and you know, you'll find it that way. 
put my name in and put Rapture in, you should be able to find me. So, so, um, so it, it's not a question of whether there will be a rapture, a snatching away, it's when. when. And Paul doesn't tell us. But what this does remind us of is something that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, which is that resurrection chapter. So let's turn quickly to that, very quickly, at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. And he's talking about um, our connection to Adam or our connection to Christ. If we're connected, connected to Christ, we're connected to his resurrection. And therefore, we will be changed. Okay? Our body, which is, he calls a natural body, will be... Oh, in 1 Corinthians 15, and we're around about 41 here. And through. Uh, so our natural body will become a supernatural body or a glorious body do you see or he calls it a spiritual body but when he's saying spiritual he doesn't mean uh, you know wraith like ghost like yeah. he just means that it's be, it will be spiritually because it will be a physical body that is rightly connected to the life of God right. okay um, so look at verse 48 as was the man of dust, that's Adam, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam, we also will bear the image of the heavenly man, that's Christ, the resurrected Christ. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God, do you see here, is not the church because it's something that we are going to nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Okay, and we've got corruption. That's what our bodies are, he says earlier. Uh, what does this mean? That, that because we're flesh and blood, we can't go to heaven in, in our bodies or we can't inherit the kingdom of God on earth in our bodies. No, flesh and blood is just a, a way of speaking about the unregenerate yeah. body, the natural body, do you see? Behold, I tell you a mystery. Here's another mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We won't all die in the body, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And then it goes on, some wonderful words there, okay? Um, so this change will be a quick change, all right? Mm -hmm. Again, he doesn't tell us when. Mm -hmm. He's just saying that it will happen. But he has talked about the second coming of Christ. He's talked about Christ being the first fruits and we changed at his coming earlier on in the chapter, verses 18 through 24-ish. Okay, so he has already located basically the timing of that event. So again, where do you place this change? Where do you place this rapture? Because you can see they coincide. It's two, again, two sides of the same coin. We get changed when we get caught up. Neither passage tells us Unless it is, and, the, and the, from what we've read so far, it would be the actual second coming of Christ. Do you see? That would be a post-tribulational rapture. Do you see that? Yes. As far as we see so far. Um, in John 14, God said, uh, sorry, Christ said, you know, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. If I come and prepare a place for you, I will come again so that and receive it to myself though, so that where I am, there you may be also. So where I am, there you may be also. He's talking to his disciples, but he's also talking to saints, the church saints through the ages. Um, he's preparing a place for us 
and he's going to heaven, his father's house, okay? Um, so those people that have died are with Christ in the places that he's prepared for them. Do you see? In heaven. And he says, I will come again and I'll take you to be with me. All right. Now again, that's not so much a rapture passage, but it's a together passage. And here it says that we will ever be with Christ. Do you see? In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. So it certainly plays into the theology of it. It doesn't sound like a yo-yo kind of deal in, in John 14. Neither does it sound like a yo-yo kind of thing in 1 Thessalonians 4. And it, this becomes even more striking because of what happens in chapter 5. So let's read on here. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, that's the world, the unsaved world, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as at labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. And he tells them to watch and so on and so forth. So he says, concerning the times and the seasons about this day, the day of the Lord, he says, I don't, I don't need to write to you. You know it. But he did need to tell them about the rapture. They didn't know that. It was a mystery. Do you see? So can you see that there is there's, there's something you've got to fit into here? They know about the day of the Lord. They know, which here is probably sudden destruction. It could be the tribulation, the second part of the tribulation, or it could be the second coming of Christ. Either way, it's bad. Okay? The day of the Lord's bad here. Um, but they know about that. What they don't know about is they're catching up. Yes? They were ignorant of that. So it's not the same thing. So you have to, again, you have to kind of keep that in um, suspension in your argument for trying to decipher when the timing of the rapture is. Um, can you see here what I'm doing? I'm going to different passages, none of which are actually saying, yes, this is, you know, the rapture will be post-tribulational, the rapture will be pre-tribulational, or mid-tribulational, or pre-wrath. Okay, none of them are saying that. So none of these can be, I hope you can see, that the doctrine of the rapture cannot be uh, derived from a direct quotation of scripture as far as its timing is concerned. And it's, neither can it be an inevitable consequence of putting together different passages of Scripture because there isn't enough detail, like there is with the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. There's enough detail for you to come out with the doctrine of the Trinity. So we don't have a C1 or a C2 doctrine here. We have a C3, and I've called a C3, uh, an inference to the best explanation, which is what the scientists talk about when they, they're talking about their scientific theorizing. You, you get that theory which has the most, uh, dis, uh, sorry, which takes the most data and makes sense of it with the fewest problems. An infer inference to the best explanation. That's what I believe the pre-tribulational rapture is. It's an inference to the best explanation. All right? Can you say that again? <laughs> Starting from where? <laughs> just, your last, um, just your last sentence. Just a... It's an inference to the best explanation. That's what I thought you said. I just wanted to be sure. sure. <laughs> but I'm not there. So, um, now the thing is with these inferences to the best explanation is, because, is that somebody's not going to necessarily agree that it is the best explanation. Right. And that I've surveyed all the right data and I may not have done. 
But you see, that's the nature of what I call the C3. It's, you can argue about it, you know? It can be overturned. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. So we are to hold the doctrine of the rapture, whether we hold it pre-tribulationally or post-tribulationally or in between E, uh, we, we have to hold the doctrine of the rapture, you know, not tenaciously, okay? But, I mean, we can hold it as a hope, we can hold it as, as uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced it's pre-tribulational, but I'm not dogmatic about it, okay? Not dogmatic about it. Um, so those are the kinds of areas where we are not to shred each other yes. as believers. Correct. <laughs> um, Correct. And furthermore, what I, this is uh, making myself terribly unpopular with this particular lesson, so we'll have to edit it. But, um, <laughs> but furthermore, there are people who have whole ministries based on the pre-tribulational rapture mm -hmm. or the pre-wrath rapture. Mm -hmm. And if what I've said is correct, I think that is terribly wrong. That's my opinion, okay, but it's terribly wrong. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Cat among the pigeons again. Um, this is a long sentence. Paul does like long sentences. Um, so I'm just going to be rude and interrupt him in verse 5. Which is manifest evidence, this is the, the uh, persecutions and tribulations that you endure, verse 4. Manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. There it is again, it's a future thing. For which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance oh, on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. All right, well, what's that? That appears to be the second coming of Christ, doesn't it? Yes. So we're back to post-tribulation again. That's their strongest verse. I, I've, I have problems with this one. Okay, I'll be honest with you, I do. Um, what I think, this is the way I explain it. Maybe I'm explaining it because uh, I'm like any person who's got a theory that he likes. You know, he's trying to explain away something he doesn't like. So I might be doing that, okay? But um, my feeling here is that he's conflating this because his focus here is on the tribulation that is coming on unbelievers. Do you see? So he's not here talking about a, an exact chronology. He's talking about the, the tribulation and the suffering and the vengeance that will come upon them. And he's talking about a time of tribulation. He's talking about this is capped off by, by Christ's second coming and hell, or what we call hell. Yes? I mean, he's putting it all together, lumping it all together. Do you see? Yeah, because he talks about everlasting um, destruction. In that day, well, what's the day? Okay, day of the Lord, I think, maybe you can say that, but the day of the Lord is not just a single day. Okay, it's a, it's a period. Okay, and uh, it's kind of an elastic term as well in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. But uh, eschatologically, the day of the Lord seems to be, uh, and people disagree with this in some ways, but it seems to be uh, from... Uh, the let's say the taking out of, of the church if we believe that but seems to be from the start of the tribulation until actually all the way back until Satan is defeated and this earth is destroyed okay I haven't got there yet but you're going to see that that is used by Peter in that in that way 
Okay, so it just means different kind of things, but if, if you want to look at one big period, it's, it's God's time of intervention and judgment upon earth, the culminating actions of God. Yeah, if you want, but a, a visitation gives you the idea of kind of coming and going. So we have to, you know, it's up to you what you want to use, as long as you know what you mean. So again, that's kind of strong on the post-tribulational era or idea, but it, it doesn't actually say post-tribulational because it's not talking about the rapture. Do you see? So now we've got to go to chapter 2. And chapter 2, again, throws us a bit of a spanner into the works because it says here, verse, um, verse 2, we're not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, because people were writing letters in Paul's name even back then, in the early 50s AD. As though the day of Christ, and you may have the day of God, okay, or day of the Lord, had come. Do you see? Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, the apostasy. And the man of sin, or lawlessness, is revealed the son of perdition. Or you might, what else do you have? Son of destruction? No, no, I mean, what does the text say? Okay, perdition, destruction, okay is revealed, okay? So this man, this individual, must come before the day of the Lord. You see that? He's got to be revealed. Okay, and he's given also called the son of destruction or perdition. Okay. Um, there's one person in the Bible called the son of perdition. Do you know who it is? Satan. Nope. Judas. 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 Judas, who is called a devil, also by Jesus. Uh, Judas is a really weird character. Okay? He dies and he goes to his own place in Acts 1. Okay? It's a weird thing to say about him. I don't know what all that means, okay? but he's weird. He's from Kerioth, which is in uh, Moab. God hates Moab. In uh, Isaiah 34, you'll see he's going to turn um, Edom and Moab, that area, he's going to turn it into a... Uh, basically a, a pit of, you know, of fire and brimstone. Um, so he doesn't like it. Anyway, let's see how, how uh, Paul speaks of him. Who opposes, verse 4, and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Or who's this guy? Okay. Where do you go for a reference to this guy? Would well, you... Would that be back in Isaiah? No, but it's back in Daniel. You would go to Daniel and you go to the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Who speaks these blasphemies against God? And, pers and pursues the saints of the Most High. Who's Israel? Ah, no, now we're in trouble. Do you see? Because this guy, the Antichrist, if we can use that term of him, Paul doesn't here, but if we can use that term of this, this guy, you know, when we've seen him crop up before, and possibly in Zechariah as well, uh, He's persecuting Israel. Jesus said, when you see the 
the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, the nails, which will be in the temple. Let he that is in Judea flee. Okay, pray it's not on the Sabbath. It's Jewish context, you see, it's not church context. So, um, hold, I mean, we have some kind of, we have some confusion here, folks. We do have some confusion because the more we find out, the more data we collect, the more sorting we have to do, and we have to sort between, hold on, this is Israel, and the Antichrist goes against Israel, I mean, I know that, but the church is going to be taken out. Well, Paul says that, the, that uh, after he's dealt with the Gentiles, he'll go back to Israel again. And Gentiles there is a metonymy, basically, figure of speech, you know, for not just Gentiles, but the church, you see, but mainly it's meant mainly Gentiles. Um, so if that's the case, then the church has got to be taken out or, or removed somehow before he goes and deals with Israel. Do you see? Because he only has Israel left to deal with. Yes. Covenantally, he's got to deal with them. All right? So, so that means, do we have the church and Israel going through the tribulation? That's what some people say. But that becomes a, a mixing of God's theological purposes and it ignores Paul's teaching in Romans 11. And also the Old Testament teaching uh, about Israel too, time of Jacob's trouble and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it makes sense that the church, which knew about the day of the Lord and the tribulation in 1 Thessalonians 5, but didn't know about the rapture, that the rapture being something different happens maybe at a different time. Do you see? I am aware that my arguing is mainly deductive and inferential. Okay, I'm aware of it. So that's why I've got to be careful because I'm trying to make the most of data, you see? And you can throw the yo-yo rapture thing in there as well because of its absurdity. Um, you know, we go up there, ah, oh, great, you know, oh yeah, we're going to join the army <laughs> and we're going back again. <laughs> Not so great. But, um, I, you know, I, I hope that you can see that there's a lot of work to do with the rapture doctrine, okay? The reason that I am a pre-tribulationist is because I do not believe that God confuses who he's dealing with. He de he's dealing with the church now. When he deals with Israel, he won't be dealing with the church because the church will be complete. Mm -hmm. If the church is complete, they'd be taken out. They are not. Um, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I didn't read it, I don't think. Um, but he says here, uh, where is it? Um, yeah, where is that? Nine. Nine, there it is. I'm looking at it and not looking at it. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Okay, well, tribulation's a time of wrath. But I hope you can see, you can have a mid-tribulation rapture here too, can't you? Mm -hmm. You can? So, it doesn't settle things. You can see different people are jockeying for position, but at the, at the same time, the tribulation, remember Daniel 9, 25 to 27, talks about 70 weeks are decided upon your people. And that 70th week is a seven-year period that is centered on Israel. And to me, that is the clincher. Okay? That's the linchpin of the pre-tribulational argument for me. Nine what? Nine, Nine twenty-five through 27. That agrees with what Paul says in Romans 11... Um, 25 through 27 and uh, it agrees with uh, it gets rid of the yo-yo rapture and um, it also seems to agree with uh, John 14 1 through 3 okay so 
yo-yo is, pa is post trade, right? Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Would you cite those again? What's that? Would you cite those again? What? The, the Romans, 20, 11, yeah. Romans 11, 24 through 26 or 27. And Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. And uh, that one was 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. And then you got 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17 or 18, which says that it is a mystery, you know, that it, they didn't know before. But they did know, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, about the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Mm -hmm. So it's different. It was John 14. 14, 1, 1 through 3. Now we have here this man of sin who really reminds us of the, the little horn in Daniel 7, uh, exalting himself against God, calling himself God, okay? And he's in the temple of God, okay? Well, te that means Jews. Jews are building the temple. That's the tribulation that Jesus spoke of. Do you see? Jesus divided or appeared to divide that tribulation between the beginning of sorrows and this, then there will be great tribulation. <laughs> Excuse me, technically, technically you can't say that those are uh, real designation, technical designations for the first and second part, but uh, there is that seemingly delineation in the progression of his thought. So, uh, you have this individual and he sat in the temple of God, a rebuilt temple. Do you not remember that when I was with you, verse 5, I told you these things? So they know about, again, this is part of the day of the Lord. You see? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. The he is almost certainly the man of sin. Do you see? Uh, what is restraining is almost certainly the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Do you see? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, or it, I mean, you know, it, it can, the, the pronoun can be translated either um, with a, a gender or a neuter. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, please don't think this is the removal of the Holy Spirit. You can't remove the Holy Spirit. Okay? You can't remove the Holy Spirit from anywhere. But what you can do is you remove the Holy Spirit in his present function. Do you see? And that would speak to his function in the church the removal of the church do you see that uh, it's not a it's not a complete take home you know here we are i've got your argument <laughs> but it it makes sense and then he says uh, then the lawless one will be revealed see after after this, this, there's been this change in the Spirit's working. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. That reminds us again of Daniel 7, somewhat. The Lord comes back and stomps on him. And destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders. Well, Christ in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 warned about going after people who were doing these signs, do you see? These miracles. So I think we're in tribulational context here because he's talking about this man of sin. But <coughs> he says that this, uh, you know, this man of sin is revealed, this, this day of Christ, which I believe is uh, the tribulation and the coming of Christ, um, he, he's talking about that particular doctrine. And uh, just to finish it off here, uh, he says, um, with all, ver uh, verse 10, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. There is a definite article there that they may all be condemned who did not believe in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Um, so, um, the book of Revelation will help us a little bit on this, as far as the rapture is concerned, but that kind of that's, that, that's kind of the main argument, even though I'd need a lot longer to set it out properly. So, we're at half past eight, which is what I didn't want to be at, because <laughs> I wanted to get into Hebrews. Um, so what you're going to have to do is, um, I'll just do a, a couple of prefatory remarks, and then I want you to read it with certain eyes, okay? So, I think I said something about this the last time, but, but Hebrews is written by an author. It's probably not Paul. But it's written by an author um, who uses very good Greek. He's well educated. You know, stylistically, this is, this is well formatted and formed. It's well planned out, okay? This guy knows how to put an argument together. He knows how to take you from one piece of information to another piece of information and put an argument uh, together, as I said. Um, which means that, that when we're reading the book of Hebrews, what we can't do is that when we come upon a verse that seems to threaten or uh, threaten that we can lose our salvation. I mean, for some of us, we might be all right with that doctrine, but um, for those of us that, that think that that clashes with the end of Romans 8 <laughs> and some other passages, you might think, well, that's strange. Hold on, we can't have that. And the new covenant, the whole idea of a new covenant, you know, I mean, it's an unconditional covenant, so... Um, so what on earth are you to do? Don't we have a contradiction going on here? Well, I'm going to ask you to read the epistle to the Hebrews as if it was written to Hebrews. Okay? Which is what it says, it, who it says it's written to. Not necessarily Hebrew Christians, because it doesn't say it's written to Hebrew Christians. Now, I know, I know, but it's written during the church age and it's written, you know, so there'll be Christians around. Yes, I know, and there's a lot of stuff in it that is for Christians. But the Gospel of Matthew was written in the church age too. But not everything in the Gospel of Matthew is written to us. Do you see? Um, read it as if it was the last book of the Old Testament. Old Testament. Read it as if you'd never read Acts and Paul's epistles. Okay, you maybe read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But read it like that. When you, whenever the spectre of church and and regeneration and the, and so on comes in, you're going to read some stuff, obviously, about Christ because it's written after he ascended. But read it as an Old Testament epistle and see how you come out of it. See if your um, understanding of it changes somewhat. 